Video games are a very popular form of entertainment. Millions of people across the world play video games every day to relax, have fun, and hang out with their friends. Many people also consider video games, with their complex art and animation and vibrant stories, to be an art form. Like all other art forms, you have your Mona Lisas and your Sculptures of David, iconic masterpieces that define the genre. Most of these games are produced by big companies known as AAA developers, and they require millions of dollars and countless man hours to create. However, just as there are amateur painters and sculptures, there's also amateur game developers. These independent developers, or indie developers for short, make games using nothing but their laptops, a variety of free tools, and a lot of creativity. These games are works of art in their own right, and today we're going to take a closer look at what goes into making them. We'll also talk to some indie developers and learn more about their experiences, and we'll show you a sneak peek of some of their games in progress. Uh, my current game is Tank to the Skies. It's a multiplayer uh, kind of arena battler. My game is a local co-op game. The first player and the rest of the players, neither of them knows which one is which. So they're, they're going to have to try to figure out who they are and try to find a way to take out the player without being killed themselves. This guy comes in a, in a time machine, parts of the machine fell off, and you have to like travel through time, and learn about like, tectonic in order to prepare it. I started working on Superdome Man, I made a quick prototype for it, um, and then said, cool, this is a fun game later. I was playing with my roommate, and we started playing games to 50 points of Superdome Man every day. So for this game, um, I'm kind of exploring like the medium of the keyboard and like how you can input. Basically, right above where you actually press the key is where the little wave goes up on the screen. Ground Pounders. Uh, it was a game that me and a friend of mine worked on at a recent uh, game jam. It's like a 2D platformer. You try to knock them into the ceiling by pounding the ground. Um, and when you do it, it creates these huge waves that can push people uh, up into spikes on the ceiling. So for this game, I wanted both a, a multiplayer game, sort of in the essence of Towerfall, and I also wanted to make a kind of physics-based game that didn't suck because I played a lot of physics games that I didn't like and I felt like they could have been done better. And then I also wanted, um, I had this idea that I wanted to create a world with sort of, uh, not really anthropomorphic, but like kind of inanimate objects with personality. And I settled on these tanks that can launch themselves around with gunfire I wanted to include story in there because you know, growing up I liked the educational games with more of like a story angle, characters I could relate to. And I think it integrates more well into the like trying to learn about it if you have like a guy like there's a reason why you're trying to learn this stuff. You're greeted by a guy who he introduces himself as Dr. Ungrove. His time machine, three of the parts have been sent throughout time. You have to go and collect them and in order to install them on the machine. You need to enter these multiple choice tests. So try to like integrate the learning objectives with a story like that. I, during the Super Bowl, um, saw a tweet uh, by another game developer that said, why do they call it the Super Bowl if it's not even super? Like, they need things like multi-shot and power-ups. And so I said, that's hilarious. I'm going to make that game. I started working on Super Dunk Man a couple weeks later and made a quick prototype for it. And then said, cool, this is a fun gameplay for my friends were doing. It's from this little prototype I had, sort of fleshing out the whole experience. It's still a simple idea, but it's just kind of fully fleshed out. It has a lot of, it just, everything about it feels great. Uh, the biggest one is uh, time, probably, just because I'm doing this on the side. Obviously, school comes first, so there are some weeks that like, I just can't touch it very often. So, the first problem I ran into was that my lack of coding experience. Uh, I'm still a freshman here at UW. I'm running into trust and trouble, so pathfinding is becoming especially problematic because having to keep track of where obstacles are and how they're going to move according to that, and also keeping it realistic enough to fool the first player is going to be a very tough challenge, but I'm hoping to find someone who can help me out with that at the Game Dev Club. Or... What's started to develop as a challenge now for this game is kind of mastering this creative inspiration to actually do the sort of huge project that I want to. Because whereas I think with most games, you make the sort of medium of interaction, which could be something really simple like arrow key controls or mouse controls or something like that. And then after you do that initial stage, you go into like level design and just sort of creating the experience. But for this game, the entire, like the whole experience is the control interaction. What are new ways of interacting with the keyboard that actually fit with the theme of the game. 
and how the heck am I going to program these different ways of interaction which may have never been done before. Sort of the biggest event that's happened recently is I started working on this game as a team and transitioning to working on it alone to working in a team. When you're working alone, you don't have to, you know, explain your decisions to anyone. You can just do what feels right. And then working as a team, not only do you kind of have to have a reason for making a big change, either like defend your vision against what other people want to do, or like, you know, accept that you're going to have to uh, uh, compromise on certain things. Um, I have played games since a young age and actually have been more into the psychology of video games and video game design kind of for its own sake. Basically like the perceptual experience of playing a game and how that is like, for example, something like seeing your character, what the sort of perceptual experience of that is uh, as opposed to just what we experience in everyday life. We're looking at something that we associate as an extension of ourselves and we have control over that. It's a different perceptual experience that we really ever experience in, in real life. So that's kind of what got me into it. And just thinking about like, what can I do with game design to explore these different perceptual experiences? They're just a big part of my life. They always have been. When my friends and I hang out, we will play video games, you know? So I have a very deep connection to games and like the, just the fun they can bring and the, the feelings they can give you. It feels really satisfying to just kind of chase um, the feeling that I like to give to other people. At our event, VR Burger, I just got to see so many people play the game and just really, really enjoy it, you know? And eventually I didn't even have to explain the game because a couple people would rotate in and join the new groups who would explain it to them. And I was just like, yes. So just kind of chasing, getting people to have fun basically and feel something one way or the other, you know? They've been doing it since maybe like eighth grade, ninth grade, you know, really basic back in the day. Um, but I think uh, like one thing it allows me to like, you know, pursue but spark forms, you know, drawing and sound, telling a good story. Games offer like a unique way to do that. So I like started wanting to make games when I was four, um, and I never really gave up on that idea. Because why I still make games is I think games are like a really interesting art form. As you're like playing the game, right, you're actually, everything you do is part of like your choice, right? So even games that don't have like decisions or branching paths or choices, you're actually, the way you decide to move around in it, you can decide not to do what the game wants you to do. You can decide to do what the game wants you to do. You can decide to walk in zigzags. You can decide to walk straight. Everything is just kind of like, it's just beautiful. I have like control over this thing, but I'm still experiencing something that's a game. And games are a really powerful way to wrap an emotion and then ship it off. Video game development can be a challenging art medium, but it's also extremely flexible and rewarding. Anyone can get started if they're willing to learn. If you want to learn more about indie games, or maybe pick up a few to play yourself, check out Itch.io, a website where indie developers publish their games. You can read more about them and their games, buy their games, and donate to them. You can also check out your favorite game store and ask what indie games they have in stock. If you're interested in making games yourself, there are a lot of good options out there to get started. Unity and Game Maker are both free game engines, and they both come with tutorials that will walk you through the basics of creating your own games, from code to art. You can also find plenty of online classes about programming, art, design, other related topics with a quick Google search. If you're a UW student, you can also check out the Game Development Club. They're happy to take in new members and teach them how to turn their ideas into fun new games. Check out the video description for more information and resources for finding and creating indie games. Thanks for watching!